Aha. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you. Oh, God, I thank you so much. <laughs> okay, now, Lord, you're going to have to help me on the rest of this, through this, Lord. I need your help, and I need you to give me strength and understanding. Thank you. <laughs> Lord, may this time be totally anointed in you. Thank you for all you're doing in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Surprise of all surprises, we're, we're speaking on um, inheritance. <laughs> this is number five. We've gotten a lot done here. It's pretty good. I think we're just dying to be an heir. Amen. Pun totally intended. Let's go over some review. Last week, you receive everything in your spirit. Your spirit has it all. Spirit is, you got it. Who are you in your spirit? You are amazing. You are a brand new creation. You're not the person you were before you got born again. You are different. You are absolutely, you're, you're down to your DNA has changed. There's amazing things that happen. Your spirit is absolutely, totally, totally changed. You have everything, though, in your spirit. You are a full son to your father. You've been born into the father's family. Jesus is your co-heir. He's your brother. He's the firstborn among many brethren. He's your brother. The father is your father. The Holy Spirit is the spirit. Amen. I don't know what else to say there. Okay. But you are in the process in your soul of changing. You have everything in your spirit, but you're the process in your soul. That's what we're trying to get done. Uh, it was just kind of funny today to listen to this church and to, to sit there and, and, and just kind of giggle through how many times they, they say things like, lay down your life, you know, <laughs> and all these different things. And it was, it was one of those mornings, oh boy. And it was a good message. It was really fun, but they're just they just they're just not tweaked in certain areas. It'd sure be be nice if they did. But you're in the process in your soul of being saved. That's amazing. Um, you have not adopted all of the Lord's ways in your everything. <laughs> you haven't adopted them into your lifestyle. Therefore, your soul has not been adopted totally. So we are sons, born sons in our spirit. We are adopted sons in our soul. Okay, where we have the spirit of adoption that is working on us and helping us. Oh man, that is just absolutely amazing. Okay, but because of that, you're kind of limited in your sonship. You're only a child of God in the places where you are a child of God. In the other areas where you are not a child of God, you're not a child of God. And you say, well, that's, you're sounding that redundant. No. Where did you put yourself? Are you submitting that under his fatherhoodness? Are you dying to self in that area? Are you raised to be a son in those areas? Uh, these are very good questions. Yes. You must drive out all the current inhabitants to gain your inheritance. Who are the current inhabitants? Us. Us. The us that is not us. Our schizophrenic us. Our little other person, <laughs> our little, uh, if any man, uh, let's see, the uh, uh, double sold person out of he, uh, James. James and First Peter, okay? <laughs> Pretty crazy. We know that Jesus has paid the price for everything, okay? How much does he own? <clears throat> well, we belong to him, spirit, soul, and body. Now that's kind of a fascinating deal because our salvation is in our spirit, but our soul is not saved yet. Meaning what? He owns it, but he doesn't possess it. He owns it, but he doesn't possess it yet. He has not gained possession. We have not allowed him to gain possession. Therefore, in some parts of our soul, we're not his. Okay? We're not under the king. He told us to take the ground and give it back to him. That's really good. So we've got to do what? Take back the purchased possession. We've got to give those parts of our soul that are not his 
they are his, but he's not in possession of them, and bring them into submission, bring them into possession. How do we know what areas in our soul that, that that's needed? Jesus. Yeah, conviction, okay. <laughs> Guys, it's not that hard to find. Anybody, you, you with me on that one? You, you, you find those? How come they're so difficult to get rid of? Because we don't want to. We like them. We, like them. Mm. we believe that it benefits us something. <laughs> Which shows that we are stupid. Mostly. We're just ignorant of it. Yeah. It's a lot of it. But the more we gain understanding of what is true, the more we want to get rid of things. And so we must bring our soul back to Him. That's the whole idea. Bring it back to Him. We must dispossess the old man. So last week we talked about 1 Corinthians 6, 9-10. through 10. And uh, we started talking about the kingdom. Or do you not know that unjust ones will not inherit the kingdom of God? This is, like I say, one of the things that really got me going on why I wanted to study this thing out. Is that this was a question for me. Why not? Okay, I see people all the time. I know churches that talk about kingdom this, kingdom that, kingdom everything. In fact, is even today in the announcements they're talking about kingdom this, the kingdom that. And it tickled me. Okay? And I, I just, you want to stand up and say, but do you understand what the kingdom is? Okay, hello? Yeah. You know, how are you going to be preaching against the stuff that's going to make it so you can't inherit the kingdom? That just kind of like got my attention. Yeah. It has this list that it says, Nor plunders shall inherit the kingdom of God. In these two verses, it says you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. <laughs> Twice! I mean, this is a very important thing that the Lord is trying to say. You're not going to inherit the kingdom. Now, this isn't given to Old Testament people. 1 Corinthians was written to whom? The church. The church. Believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. The assembly. The ecclesia. Yep. They were born again. Unrighteous. Not submitted to righteousness is what the unrighteous is. The issue is not their salvation. They were saved. We have grace and overall forgiveness in our spirit. Okay, grace. Boom. But, what is the kingdom? The kingdom is living under the rule and care of a king. And if we're not going to submit these things under his kingship, then that makes them not part of his kingdom. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is one of those little logic things that go, ah, that makes total and absolute total sense. In our logic. In our emotions. <laughs> it doesn't make as much sense. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Our emotional logic is like, it's like really funky. What's wrong with our emotional logic? Well, we are saved in our spirit completely. We are in the process of salvation in our souls. We are indebted to live according to the spirit, not the flesh. And there's gaining no benefit of living in the kingdom in the areas where we're walking in the flesh. We gain no benefit of the kingdom. That should bother us. <laughs> yeah. huh? That should bother us. Why aren't we seeing the healings that they saw like they did? Like there are signs and wonders and everything happening right at, in the beginning church. These guys didn't know squat. They didn't know anything. Really. They knew the Old Testament some and everything. They didn't know. They just didn't know. And yet they knew so much. Kind of amazing. They had signs and wonders and church growth. Everything happening, just boom, on everybody. Every one of the deacons was there to serve tables. How were they discovered to be people of power? They were doing signs and wonders. And But the disciples of the twelve, what did they say? We don't want to serve tables. We have too many things to do teaching the Word of God and helping people. You know, We can't do the ministry of the Word if we're always setting tables. So they had other people doing the setting the tables, but those guys that were setting the tables were still going out mm -hmm. and having miracles and signs and wonders, Stephen being proof of that. Okay, I just wrote about him this week, so he's kind of stuck in my mind. All right. So all the things that we've just been discussing, that's right. What are you, chapter 28 now? Oh, 
I hear you laughing back there. Okay. All the discussions we've had about the, the inheritance is wrapped up in this thing about the kingdom. It's ground not redeemed. And we did do the picture here of, we know this chart. Well, the king is in us. You cannot separate the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So the king is in us. Meaning what? Well, now this little chooser is like really important. But if we choose to walk in sin, what happens? Well, the outcome is death. And then what happens then? That comes back on us. Why do we not get this? This is, this is so simple, isn't it? <laughs> it is simple. It is simple. It's not easy, but it is simple. Okay? Kind of fascinating. Where's your heart? Well, the heart's the connection between the spirit and the soul. Meaning what? The things of the attitudes we're supposed to have, the attributes that God is supposed to make us, it has been given to us, but He wants the kingdom to be functional through all of us. He wants the kingdom through all of us. He really does. He really does. Not just your mental logic. He wants the kingdom to be part of your emotional logic. Hmm. You know, the more we spend time in our emotions worshiping Him, a little bit like what we were doing today, the more our emotional logic lines up to Him. Okay? Can you justify the anger that you have experienced during the week and worshiping Jesus? Can you put that in the same context? Kind of like, no. Bless the Lord on my soul and all that is within me. All that is in me. Smack this guy in the head. All right. It was just like, so, you know, yeah, this is the big problem is that he wants the kingdom to be functional in our emotions also. Our emotional logic has got to be something that we are also praising him with. We know that there are things called hardness of heart. And those hardness of heart issues do what? Well, they mess up everything. They make it so that the things of the Spirit cannot make it into my soul. The things of the kingdom are not in me. Through the hardness of heart, the wounds, and the choices. We have got to forgive. Guys, I don't know of any one single thing that is more important to getting the kingdom within us than forgiveness. Okay? It, it, it takes away all wounds. Okay? That makes repentance... Absolutely phenomenal, because what does it do? It takes away all choices. It takes away the pain. So, just between forgiveness and repentance, we have the av availability to absolutely wipe out all hardness of heart. Two things. I make it sound so, so piece of cake, man. It's so simple. You could be a perfect Christian for only 1999. <laughs> do two things. Right. Forgive everybody and repent for everything. Yay! It would work. Okay? It would work. And because of the hardness of heart, then therefore, I don't see who I am. Therefore, I don't see that I am the son. I don't see my inheritance. I don't see my power. I don't see my authority. I don't see anything of the kingdom. Crazy, isn't it? Yep. So, then we looked at Revelations 21, 7 through 8, which is teaching on Revelation, so it's supposed to satisfy all those of you who want me to teach on Revelation. Here it is. I don't trust you anymore. <laughs> the one overcoming will inherit all things. Thanks. You want to do fun little study? Just go ahead and look through Revelations with the word called overcomer. Overcoming. You need to have fun. To the overcomer I will. All the letters of the, the seven churches Every one of them said something about a promise to the overcomers. Every single letter. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, kind of interesting. We have lots we don't understand. Okay? We have lots we don't understand. And I will be God to him, and he will be a son to me. But for the cowardly, unbelieving, those having become foul, and murderers, and fornicators, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all the lying ones, their part will be in the lake burning with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. This is 
only, all these promises are given only to the overcomers. Continuance in the sin is not overcoming that sin, is it? It's not overcoming. So, but then it says one thing really bad, and that's over there on the left hand side. It says, having become foul. The issue is they did the thing. It wasn't so much the doing anymore. Now it was the being. They had done it to the point that they are now being it. Okay? If somebody steals, people call him a thief. Not necessarily. He steals. But his identity, he keeps stealing, he will eventually become a thief. Or that's what he does. Okay? No. I've stolen. doesn't make me a thief. I repented for it. All this sort of stuff. Nope, it's not who you stole. <laughs> really? <laughs> Did you give them back the pen? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was gonna steal one of those pens today. <laughs> that is funny. Okay, the end result is a selfish focus, an identity. If they continue on it, okay, it shows. So, so it shows why. Shows why the inheritance is, is bad news. Everyone is born a sinner. We all have been given a way out. We don't have to sin. Romans 6.14. Heard that somewhere before. There's an echo in the room. By grace we have been given a better, much better life. And therefore, the nasty thing to be said, we determine our end result. Isn't that just the nastiest thing you could... Tell somebody. <laughs> it's all your fault. You can't blame anybody. Can't blame anyone. That's the end of it. Okay? Which is too good. Now, see that little star? I do see that little star. I That's like how you have that one side perfectly Just perfectly lined up. That, man. <laughs> My little star is there to remind me that now review is over. Now we're getting into the new stuff. <laughs> okay. Wasn't that fun? That was a half an hour review. Mercy day. We only have 30 minutes left. That's what I hear. How come? <laughs> yeah. 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 So there. Yeah. Tell them, Jeannie. You tell them. Yeah. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay out of this one. <laughs> I sense the end is not. It was good knowing you. <laughs> it's been nice being here. Hello, Jesus. I'm coming home. Okay. Inheritance. Here's the issue. In our culture, the father has to die before an inheritance can be gotten. Okay? We gain the inheritance at his death. When our dad dies, then they read the will, and the reading of the will, boom. We get the inheritance, and everybody knows what the inheritance is after somebody dies. This is normal. This is common among men. The guy, you can't get inheritance until the dad dies. Well, this makes scripture kind of tricky. Hmm. Well, when do we gain the inheritance? Because, well, I don't know if you noticed this, but our father is still alive <laughs> and cannot die. We gain it when we die. Now, this is what makes this so fun. Let's look in the scriptures. Hebrews 9, 13 through 14 says... For if by the bull, blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling those having been defiled, sanctifies the purity of the flesh, how much more, in other words, that's the old sacrifice of the old covenant, how much more the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, will purify your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. I've always loved this. His blood can actually purify our conscience to the point where we can actually serve the living God. It's the blood of Jesus. His whole purification process, man. So, what's he doing that for? He did everything so that you will be able to serve the living God. You have no excuse. They dedicated a couple little kids today, and the girl's name was Selah. Hmm. Oh, wow. they pronounced it Selah. They Selah. Okay. And it just, it tickled me. I was just like, and so what does her name mean? Pause and think about this. <laughs> That's her name. Okay. <laughs> but think about this. This is a Selah moment. What? 
you are now able. For anybody says, well, I can't do that. Then you missed it. You missed the understanding. Yeah, you can. You are able to serve the living God. Why? Well, I, I can't preach. If God says for you to preach, you can. Because you are able to serve the living God. Amen. Okay, why well, can't go out healing? Listen to God. Because He says, you can. We are able to serve the living God. All excuses have just been killed right there. Just look down at your feet and you find your excuses dead, laying there in a pool of blood. That's it. That's the end of them. Who killed my excuses? <laughs> Jesus did. Jesus. But the very next verse says this. And because of this, He is the mediator of a new covenant. Remember the old covenant. Because of His blood and His ability to bring us into the work of being able to do all the service of God, He's a mediator of a new covenant. That is, death having occurred for redemption of transgressions under the first covenant, the ones being called might receive the promise of the everlasting inheritance. He says, yeah, there's a good things happening in the Old Testament. Now, how do I know there's a good thing happening? Well, Jesus went down there, preached to them, Gave them salvation. Brought them as their faith was looking forward to the cross. He came down after the cross and gave them eternal salvation. And they won it. He fulfilled the entire Old Testament. Just this week he will do that. If you're paying attention. <laughs> okay. How fascinating. It says, but the ones being called, meteor new covenant to the ones being called might receive the promise of Everlasting inheritance. The everlasting inheritance. Through what? Through covenant. Now, we saw this last week about the covenant. Okay? We keep bringing up covenant. Why do we keep bringing up covenant? Because it's like really important. Okay? I think it's kind of fascinating when one's being called. Are you? Yep. When were you called? Before the foundations of the earth. When were you called? Oh. Well, that's an embarrassing story. <laughs> <laughs> Down, Nathaniel, okay? <laughs> when were you called? You were called. Okay, this is a very, very big thing. As everybody says, well, I wasn't called to the ministry. Yeah, you were. Y yes, you were. That's to do right. what? Because... We are called, who? All those who have been able to serve the living God. Uh, he has made you able. He has called you. He's brought you in. Now, He spoke your name. He spoke you into existence. The second you were born again, what happened? He created a brand new creation in Christ, didn't He? Yep. You following me? Are you a new creation? Yep. Brand new creation. He spoke you into existence. He spoke spoke that's the calling <laughs> you didn't so see this you would be correct in saying the old you could not serve exactly but the old you no longer exists right hmm so since the old you no longer exists then your old excuses no longer exist ha <laughs> Which means that you now have to get into a whole new journey of rediscovery. Well, what am I able to do? Bingo! That's the whole journey of new identity in Christ, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Amen. The first covenant was cool. The second covenant is better. We receive the promise of the everlasting inheritance. Remember last week we talked about the Holy Spirit of promise. What is this promise? See, this promise thing is fascinating. It's when God speaks something that we're going to get. He gives us a promise. Well, the Holy Spirit is making sure that promise is going to be fulfilled. What was the promise? What do you think? What's the promise? Salvation. Salvation and? Eternal life. And? Jesus. And, <laughs> and all of it. Okay, all the promises, all the beautiful things, the healing, the supply, the, the things that he's doing for people, the, everything. We're all part of the promise. The great and the precious promises are all ours in the revelation knowledge of Jesus. Man, the Holy Spirit promises make sure it's all going to happen. And where is that promise? Right there in our inheritance. Which was spoken after Adam and Eve, after Adam had sinned, 
And God said, the serpent will bite your heel, but you will crush his head. Jesus got his heel bruised. And Jesus is. Yes. Totally. Okay, he won it all, didn't he? Okay. Would it be more accurate to say Holy Spirit of promises, making it plural? No. Nope. Rather than just singular. No, it's singular because he's the Holy Spirit of promise. Not just the promises. He's the Holy Spirit of a being of promise. It's not just specific promises. It's that he himself is the being of that promise. To have him has everything. I hope I said that right. It made sense in here. It got a little muddled. It did. <laughs> Translation some days doesn't quite make it out. <laughs> Is it... Would it be wrong to say this because um, you the the uh, down payment the earnest um, payment of mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit in us is the down payment the of earnest money right that's true are you finishing that sentence or was that the end of it um well it's an indication of the promise that okay. dwells in us yes that there will be an end result which is part of the calling thing. It all goes together. I don't want to get hung up on that. i got bigger, bigger things to do today. Okay. And it talks about promise of the everlasting inheritance. We have a better inheritance than all of them because our inheritance is everlasting. everlasting. I love it. The very next two verses says this. For where a testament is, the death of the one testating must be offered. For a testament is firm over a dead one, since it never has force when the one testating lives. Now there are some words. Testing. Yeah, let's 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 play with this just a little bit. For where a testament is, let's find out what it really means. Covenant. A testament is a covenant. Okay? Oh. For where a covenant is, the death of the one testating. What does that mean? Making testament of the covenant, the one speaking forth the covenant, must be offered. We, this is fascinating. For a testament is firm over dead ones since it never has force. For a covenant is firm over dead ones since it never has force when that one testating lives. This is interesting. Covenant, testament, will, these are all the same thing. Okay? I think this is fascinating. For where a covenant is. Now, we is that always translated? I mean, it's always covenant and not testament? Testament, covenant, same Greek word. Same Greek word. Always. Mm -hmm. Always. Okay. Okay. Out on okay, you just knocked yourself out. <laughs> I tell you. you know, <laughs> this is fascinating. Do you remember when Abram cut up the animals and split them out on the path of blood, mm -hmm. and then the father and the son walked the path. Why the path of blood? Why was blood covenant, the thing that talked about blood covenant through the old, whole Old Testament, why blood? Because when you enter into covenant with somebody, what are you saying? Right now today is the end, it's the death of my independent living. I am no longer living for me. I am now living for you. That's what covenant is all about. It's the death to independent living. Um, what is the, the covenant of blood? It, actually, it was saying this. As we walk the two halves of these animals split and we walk down this path of blood, what we are saying is, if I do not fulfill what I have made my commitment to do, you can cut my body in half. In essence, I'm dead now. I just haven't... I uh, haven't realized it. haven't that. realized it yet. <laughs> I just, it just hasn't ha totally happened. But I am dead. I am dead to my former. I am dead. If, anything, if I do anything different, I'm just... I'm dead. I have we already given you the death sentence to kill me. What are we talking about here? We're talking about for the covenant had to have a death sentence in it. There had to be a death. For where covenant is, the death of the one testating must be offered. i got to offer the death. For a covenant is firm over dead ones, since it never has force when the one testating lives. As long as I'm alive to me, I'm not being 
right. I've got to be alive to him, dead to me. Am I making sense? Mm-hmm. It is a, this is a fan, fun passage, okay? I love this passage. Romans 5.8 says what? Who can quote me? We were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Yes, but God commends his love for us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He paid the penalty. So therefore, Christ died for us once for all. But then he did something very... Oh, he cheated. Oh, Jesus cheated. He cheated bad. He died to fulfill the covenant. And then he rose again. So there was a death and he's still alive. Hmm. How interesting. See, this is like... I'm pretty sure the insurance companies would have a problem. Real, real, real problem with that. Okay. I'm having a very fun time with that little logic in my book. I'm having a very fun time with this. Roxy said I could go into Romans 6. So, Romans 6. Thank you, Roxy. Yep. (laughs) She says, I did not give you permission. (laughs) Okay. What then shall we say? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Let it not be. We who died to sin, how shall we still live in it? Or are you ignorant that all who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Into what? His death. His death. Now, this is where it's going to be really fun for us. Is our joining to Jesus in his death and in his burial and his resurrection. Okay? Uh, in our spirit, we did die to sin. How? What was the mechanism of that? Because we were united with Jesus, baptized into Christ Jesus. Okay? We were immersed into Him, baptized into His death. So, this is kind of fascinating. Into His death. Us joining into Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection means what? For us to join into His death means we died. Therefore, therefore, if we died, we gain inheritance. <laughs> See, in God's way of doing inheritance, it's not the Father who dies to gain the inheritance, it's the inheriting one who dies to gain it. Not the inheritee, but the inheritor. I don't know how that works. Okay, so I have to think about that more. But the, not the inheritor, not the one who's, who's giving the inheritance is the one that's dying. It's the one who's receiving the inheritance has to die. Okay? So the simplified Jesus version is the grain that Falls. dies and goes into the soil and then turns into a plant. It has to die to being a seed. It has to be alive to being a plant. Right. Exactly. Absolutely. I think that is absolutely fascinating. Okay? And then it goes on to say, Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. Now, today, they had a baptism at the church, and they did all those scriptures. They did the Great Commission. They did and all these scriptures that we're talking about other than water baptism they used okay. <laughs> to prove their water baptism. Tickled me. Okay, I'm just like, ah, I just know that I, I just have to just let them, just shine them on, just let them go. <laughs> okay, that's not what the Great Commission talks about. That was kind of, but this was kind of fascinating. Therefore, we are buried with him through baptism into death. Which baptism? This is not water baptism. Spirit. This is the baptism when we were baptized into the family by the Holy Spirit. When we're born again. When we're born again. Is we are completely immersed into Him. (laughs) Amen. (laughs) There are four baptisms. I'll reiterate these, okay? List them off. The first baptism, and when you got born again, the Holy Spirit took you and immersed you into the family of God. It's when you are completely overwhelmed and immersed into the family of God. The second is water baptism, which is an outside symbol of what happened on the inside of you. So they take you and they go over to there's water and they dip you in there and it's a symbol of you died and you buried and you're raised to walk a new life. But wait a minute. 
that was just a symbol of, on the outside of something that already happened to you on the inside. What happened to you on the inside is that you died in Christ and you were buried in Christ and you were raised to walk in a new life. That's the second baptism. <laughs> the third ba- she is staring, looking at me like, I made a green cheese. Okay, the third baptism is the baptism of the Holy Spirit where Jesus himself immerses us into the Holy Spirit and we have the giftings and the power of God. The fourth is a baptism of fire where we are immersed in the fire of God to cut away all the junk. So, yes ma'am. I'm lost. That's okay. No, you're still saved, but you're confused. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll, we'll, talk. We'll, talk. we'll talk. We'll talk. We'll talk. I, okay. I, but this is not the baptism in water. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism. Buried with him through the baptism of the Holy Spirit into the family. We were buried with Jesus. How much? Everything. Totally. Okay, this is, this is a big deal. We were buried... We are in baptism in bapt- through death into his death. How dead did we get? Totally dead. In our spirit, totally dead. Has to be. And then as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, so also we should walk in newness of life. Why? Because our spirit man was raised, and we are as full of the resurrection power of God as as Jesus is. We are alive. We died. And we are alive. That's so important. For if we have been joined together in the likeness of his death, so also shall we be in the resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified, absolutely totally crucified with him, that the body of sin might be nullified, that we no longer serve sin. The first proof, that where does sin go? It leaves our spirit and goes to where? Body. Boom. There it is. The body of sin might be nullified. It no longer has authority over me. It's the body of sin is nullified. It doesn't tell me what to do. But it's in our body. But it's in our body. But we don't have to serve it. We don't have to serve. We don't have to serve sin. But I want to. We've noticed. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's your boy. I'm going home later. (laughs) Can I come home with you? No. What about the scripture that says that we were in Christ? All men were all men were in Adam when he sinned. Mm-hmm. And and the believer was in Christ mm-hmm. when he was on the cross. Yes. How does that fit Perfectly. with this? Perfectly. Because but, while Jesus was on the cross is when I was baptized into him. That's when I was immersed into that death. I was put inside. Baptism just means to immerse, to submerge, to overwhelm, to be, to take your dishes and put them in a dishpan full of water. Bloop. I did the same thing. He did the same thing to me. He put me inside Jesus where I was completely inside him. At the time? At the time. When Jesus died, I died. See, there's no time or space in the spirit realm. So when I died, what do I do? When I come to Jesus, I died. How? I was immersed into Jesus' death. When did he die? On the cross. Did I go on the cross? Yes, I did. This is what makes Wednesday so killer for me. Because I go through it and see that his death is my death. I was in him on the cross. If any man be in Christ, he's a brand new creation. Okay? This is, guys, we're getting really deep here. <laughs> See, I get that. I, I get that. That's good. Okay? But what's the whole thing is, if my spirit is that's true in my spirit, I don't have to serve sin. Amen. Why does he make it so we don't have to serve sin? Because we don't have to serve sin, we can get that out of the road and gain the inheritance that he brought us. The sin is keeping us from that inheritance. Why? Because you do these things, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Right back to choices. Right back to choices. This is also one of those discussions you don't usually have on a Tuesday afternoon anywhere. Okay? This is is a lot deeper than than kind of sitting around Starbucks talking about stuff. Okay? This This is deeper than that. This is pretty amazing. But... 
into his death, meaning what we were joined in the testator's death. The testator, the one who is making the testament, making the covenant, were united in his death. When the Father and the Son walked the covenant pieces, why did the Father and Son do it? Because Jesus did it as the representative of Abraham. Abraham couldn't do it. He didn't have the authority. But Jesus did. And in Jesus walking the, the halves with the Father, did what? He bought it all. He bought it all. Because Abraham wasn't capable of having a full covenant right. with the Father. He didn't have the righteousness. He didn't have the righteousness. But the Son did. And then in then brought that to all of us. And that was the first instance instance of Jesus being the mediator between man and God. That's one of them. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Am I making sense here, guys? Or is this this? Uh, I'm. And you wonder how come I didn't want to get emotional at the beginning? Okay. Can you define um, like how you worded it for? Joe and Kimberly's wedding. <laughs> I'm trying. Go ahead. I'm listening. For Michael's benefit. Can you branch out on... Which part of what I said at Joe and Kimberly's wedding? As a whole wedding. Covenant. Um, the spiritual picture of people versus Jesus. Not right now. I got a place I got to go. We'll talk about the marriage covenant afterward, okay? So remind me. We'll get into that. Okay. <laughs> Hard right turn there on Johnson's Corner, man. It's like, okay. True in our spirit to be worked out in soul and body. This is all true in our spirit, worked out in our soul and body. Why do I know that? So that the body of sin might be nullified. He did this whole thing for us fulfilled it so that it would be able to come all the way down and get rid of all this stuff so that we can no longer serve sin. What can we do then? So we may serve the living God. Then it goes on to say, for the one that died has been justified from sin. But if we died with Christ, we believe that we also shall live with Him, knowing that, that Christ being raised from the dead dies no more. Death no longer lords it over Him. Amen. This, like I say, Romans 6 is just filled. This thing is just amazing. We died with the testator. The outcome of living with Him. This thing is going to be something that is affecting us so we can live a new life. We lived this whole thing. We died with Him. Now, it's not just died. It's not just being united with Him in His death. It's being united with Him in His resurrection. How much resurrection life do you have in you? All of it. All of it in your spirit. spirit. Every time you choose sin, you choose death. When you choose death, you are actually going against the resurrection life that God has given you. I, I'm starting to see those. We're full. Death. Paid in advance. Death no longer lords it over us. Okay. It's the end of authority of death over us. Now, right there should be shouting. <laughs> That's the end of the authority of death over us. Death has no authority over me. I am alive and I have what kind of life? Resurrection life. The kind of life that cannot be killed, cannot be stopped, cannot be, cannot, nothing can hinder it, except my choice of sin. It had authority over us because we were previously in covenant with it. Right on. It had authority over us because we were in covenant with it. Well, we've been given an mm -hmm. emancipation of proclamation right. that we are free. Yes. And more than that. Can it be more than that? <laughs> it's <just> heavy. <laughs> it's interesting because, okay. Why is it always seen as defilement when you go back to sin? Because it takes it away from the, the sanctification. Right. We were in covenant with sin. We broke that covenant with sin. We we're in a new covenant with the Father. And then we choose sin again. That's going back to the old marriage. Yeah. That's, that's, oh. Defiles and, the land. Yes. <laughs> Not even going to touch it. Not even going to touch it. Okay. <laughs> 
good. It's dirty. <laughs> Don't touch it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. This is this is fascinating, guys. This is this is the big stuff. For, and then it says about Jesus, for in that he died, he died to sin once for all, but in that he lives, he lives to God. Died to sin once for all. And now he lives to God, so you also. Count yourselves to be truly dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So if we are truly dead to sin and alive to God, where? In Christ Jesus our Lord. Hmm. That's fascinating. That means that we have authority to get rid of these things that are keeping us from the inheritance. I had to bring it back around to full circle. We are talking about inheritance here. <laughs> really? We have to? Because we're united in the death of the testator. Every time I go through Romans 6, I know we're in deeper trouble. I always know that we're, we're sw swimming in, in deep mud, in Holy Spirit glorified mud. Uh, it gets things. There's so much there. There had to be a death. So Jesus died to fulfill inheritance. If there has to be a death before there's an inheritance, Jesus died to fulfill the inheritance. Right, well, then he went and rose again. Well, there's the cheating part. He gained the inheritance and he's still alive. <laughs> now, this is tricky. When we got born again, what did we do? We died to our old man. Then we're united with Jesus in his death, right? And in his resurrection. So when we were raised, what happened? We were raised to live and be part of the inheritance. Because we died. So we gained the inheritance. But we're alive to spend it. Then we're also here. Yeah. <laughs> we really haven't understood that we died. No, no, we have not. We have not understood that we've died. No. I can tell that every time I bring up Romans 6. We say, hi. So here's what happens in my office. Okay, Some poor critter comes in and he's got fornication all over him. Okay, We ask him, can you see it? Lord shows him what it looks like. Great. We go back to where he entered into covenant with it. What do we do there? We repent. We ask for forgiveness. He forgives himself. Do you see all these things? These are vital parts. Then we come back up and do what? Put it to death and kill it. Why? Because it was a covenant. Mm -hmm. And we can't have covenant with it and have covenant with Jesus in that area. We have to kill it. I love this. Gain the inheritance and still be alive. And then he says, now you also do the same thing. Just what Jesus did. Gaining back purchased ter territory. Both him and you. He did it, you did it. He died to sin, you died to sin. Okay, how far? This is a, a beautiful thing. So what did he do? Jesus purchased your territory and he wants it under his rule. That's very important. Your work is to work with him. Only what has died Only what has died gets the inheritance. This needs to be taught yeah. in churches all over the place. This needs to be taught. This needs to be put out there. Okay? Putting the old man to death continually. Now, I've got to get this completed here. Remember this? If I can get rid of the hardness of heart, I can bring the kingdom get rid of other hardness of heart, and bring in the kingdom. What does that do? Bring salvation and the kingdom and the inheritance because in those areas I died. I'm letting that soak in. <laughs> okay. How much are we going to allow that death to come in? And how much of it are we not? Pretty amazing, huh? Romans 8, 12 through 13 says, So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to flesh, you're going to die. 
But if you by the Spirit you put to death the practice of the body, you will live. This is fascinating. Put to death the practice of the body. How do we do this death thing? It's already dead in our spirit. We have to put the practices of the body to death. This is our job. Something we must do. We got to put to death the bad practice of the body. And then what will happen? The life that is in our spirit brings us in and we'll live. This makes logical, perfect sense and really not easy to do. But it is something we do, taking back the purchased possession, putting it under the authority of the king. Okay? And this can be anything, guys. This can be any kind of selfishness, any kind of anger, any kind of jealousy, any kind of bitterness, any kind of unforgiveness, any kind of anything. Okay? We've got, to, we've got to be the ones to put it to death. How many times have we said, Oh God, take this away from me. And the Lord's going, But I told you in my word, you have to do it. And we've gotten into the religious part of this, trying to say that, and then, of course, when God doesn't do it, then, well, God didn't take it away. Okay. And we get defeated. Okay, another little light and fluffy passage, and we're done. <laughs> Colossians chapter 3, 1 through 3. And it says, Since then, since then, which means it is true, and it has happened, since then, you were raised with Christ. Well, mm-hmm. is it true? Yes. Yeah. Well, it says it is. Yes, I know. (laughs) But is it true in your living? Is it true how you've applied it? Have you been raised with Christ? Everything he says from here on is dependent on the fact that you have been raised with Christ. We have been raised with Christ. We have been raised with Christ. But we don't get it if we haven't... Died. If we haven't applied it, I guess is the way. To have understood it, hasn't brought it to bear. Okay, since you were raised with Christ, then it says, now do this. Since you've been raised with Christ, seek the things above. Where Christ is seating in the right hand of God. Huh, what? Uh, seek those things. Seek things above. Then it says, mind the things of God. Uh, what hasn't died can't be raised, by the way. I thought that was a good, a good line. What hasn't died can't be raised. You've been raised with Christ. You died. It's got to be true. Then it says, to do what? Change your focus and way of thinking. Mind the things above, not the things on earth. We've got to start thinking the way they think in heaven. The way Jesus thinks. The way the Father thinks. Getting our minds to the point where we're thinking the way He thinks, that gets, that's the tricky part, isn't it? You can't do that without being in the Word. can't do that without being in the Word. You cannot do that without being in the Word. Oh, study the Bible. I have to read the Bible. For you died. And your life has been hidden with Christ in God. You died. Bringing the soul into compliance. So you're really studying Jesus when you're reading the Word. Perfectly. Absolutely right. You are absolutely right. Remember that scripture in Hebrews where it says, says um, um, also I can't remember how it starts. Go on, Lee. Um, Do you not conform to this world? No. Uh, Talk about the word, Hebrews 11, or uh, Hebrews 12, whatever it is, it says, For the word of God is alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joints and marrow. Chapter 4. Is a thought and divider of the thoughts and intents of the heart. For the word of God is alive. That's not talking about a Bible. It's talking about Jesus. He is the word of God. Solid, huh? That was good. She got something for the day, guys. So it's all good. We can go home now. <laughs> no, it's all good. <laughs> Jesus is the Word. For you died and your life has been hidden with Christ in God, bringing our soul into compliance. And then it says this, Whenever Christ our life is revealed, then also you will be revealed with Him in glory. Then put to death your members which are on this earth, fornication, 
uncleanness, passion, evil, lust, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Again, who does the work? We do. You do. We do. It's something we have to do. He's already done all the work. It's something we do. What are we doing there for? Is we're taking back the purchase possession. What a privilege to sit in an office, to sit somewhere, I don't care, in a Starbucks, sit across a kitchen table, I don't care where it is with somebody, and help them take off that junk and put on the new. Take, per- take back their purchase possession. And they're, you are taking back their purchase possession and bringing them back into it because it's all about identity. Only then can there be life. Okay. So what have we learned? <laughs> you don't know. Okay. We got to put to death the death in our life. There's a sentence. (laughs) We've got to put to death the death in our life. We've got to apply the resurrection. Our death is mandatory to gaining inheritance. We must join him in his resurrection, and therefore we can do what? Walk in newness of life. Makes it sound so simple, doesn't it? We need to gain a true focus of purpose. Wasn't this fun? Yep. This is... Yeah, this is fun. Even for Nathaniel, who who blurted out the answer at the beginning and thought he knew it all. So it was all good. What? (laughs) Spoiler alert. (laughs) Inheritance is your destiny. All the blessings are yours. That's why when we're in heaven, people are going to know what our walk is on earth by what we're wearing in heaven. Possibly. I'm, because you, you know, as, okay. Because as we put on the Lord Jesus Christ, which Absolutely. means mm-hmm. the more I walk with him and choose to walk with him, I begin to change. Right. You take off the old man. And put on the, the new, new one. And it's this that I am taking and giving to the Lord. That's true. That's true. I know that's I don't know. but that's yeah. but that is what I'm really doing is I am presenting myself as a living sacrifice, holy yes. and acceptable unto the Lord. Which is your reasonable which service, is, your your actual ritual of mercy. Amen. It's true. I don't know that in heaven what we're going to be wearing will show everybody what happened to us on that, earth. No, I'm not that, sure that's true, but, but but it is true. We'll get there. Yeah, but the point is, it's not about... It's not about what we do here, because if what we do here is hasn't right. been submitted to God, true. then what we do here has no value. Amen. It's only when Amen. we do what God wants us to do It's when we become... It's what we become by what he has done. Amen. Yeah. It's the becoming that's the value of the doing. Just doing doesn't have no. value. Becoming and then doing does have value. Okay? Because it proves, you know, it proves our Father's work. Do the good works and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it shows who he has made us to be. We don't do the works to gain it. We become it. And then the good works happen. Amen. The only limitation is how much we are willing to take back. All right? Okay. Okay. I think we've squeezed it in there enough. Did you get something out of this today? Yes. This is... You, oh, there's so much. What do we need? What's, what's our final, final line on this thing is spend time with Jesus. Die Find out who you are. Bring that into your soul. What you bring into death is what will bring you to your inheritance. All right? Let me pray. Father God, I thank you. You've done a wonderful thing for us today. Lord, we covered a lot of ground. Lord, we all, each one of us, are going, oh, what did we just talk about? So, Lord, you're going to have to remind us. You have been growing our our intellect, you've been growing our our emotions, you've been growing us to know you, and Lord, may we understand you more and more and more. 
as we find out the depth of what you've shown us and what you've done for us. May this week be a deep week for each of us, Lord. May we follow you and find out in you the beauty of what you've done. We just give you praise, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a good week. <laughs> Have a passion week. Yes, yes. It's a good week. Amen. Okay. Okay.